the power of creative destruction, but it's very much based on, uh, you know, on, uh, on my book, The Power of Creative Destruction. Uh, you have a Spanish translation uh, 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 and is joined with, and the, the Spanish translation is with Planeta, Deusto, uh, um, as publishers. And, um, um, and so it's joined with Céline Antonin, who is researcher at Sciences Po Paris, and Collège de France with me, and Simon Bunel, who is a researcher at Banque de France and at Collège de France with me. Okay, so, uh, so here is a, a picture of Schum young Schumpeter. <laughs> uh, and Schumpeter is the one who introduced this notion of creative destruction uh, 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 that refers to the fact that new innovations, it's a process whereby new innovations displace old technologies, new innovations make all technologies become obsolete. And Schumpeter, you know, uh, talks about this in various writings, particularly in capitalism, socialism, and democracy. And, uh, and that's the thing. So, but the, the, uh, uh, when I started, uh, to, when I studied uh, economics, uh, there was no such thing as a Schumpeterian model of, gro of growth and development. Uh, um, you had this notion of creative destruction that people would talk about as a curiosity, And, uh, but there was no such model. I would study Solo, uh, Ramsey, you know, the neoclassical growth models. Uh, uh, there was no empirics also based on creative disruption. So, uh, so it was just an idea there, which, uh, you know, would be mentioned here and there as a curiosity. And what we did with Peter Howitt in 1987 is to build uh, a growth model uh, uh, that would encompass the notion of creative disruption. And now we, uh, people refer to it as a Schumpeterian growth model, the Schumpeterian growth paradigm. And it's a model that we, cre we created from scratch with Peter Howitt in 1987, when I was first year assistant professor at MIT, and Peter was visiting for one year from Western Ontario at MIT. So the, 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 the three main ideas that underlie the, uh, the paradigm with Peter Howitt is that first, long-run growth is driven by cumulative process of innovation. Each innovator builds upon previous innovation. The second one idea is that innovations result from entrepreneurial activities motivated by the prospect of innovation runs. Okay. And uh, so when you innovate for a while, you get monopoly runs or local monopoly runs because you have a better product or better way of doing things, a new product until you are being imitated or superseded by something better than what you are doing. Uh, and the third idea is that it's creative destruction. New innovations displace old technologies. And, and, and you see right away that at the heart of the growth process described in this model, there is a contradiction. On the one hand, you need monopoly rents to motivate innovation activities. But on the other hand, uh, uh, innovators are very tempted to use those rents to prevent subsequent innovation and block subsequent entry because they don't want themselves to be a victim of creative destruction, you see? And, and, re, and regulating capitalism, it's all about this contradiction. And this contradiction runs through the whole book, whether you talk about the industrial takeoff, whether you talk about uh, middle income trap, or about secular stagnation, or about inequality, uh, or about environment, you always come across this, uh, uh, this contradiction, okay? So that's, a, uh, it's really the whole book is moved by this, is uh, driven by this contradiction and how to manage it. Schumpeter himself was very pessimistic about the future of capitalism. He thought that the first innovators would turn into uh, entrenched incumbents, you know, entrenched conglomerates that would successfully prevent any subsequent innovation. So he thought that uh, capitalism was doomed. But in fact, in this book, we are much less pessimistic than Schumpeter because we believe that there are forces that can be activated to avert the pessimistic prediction of Schumpeter. Doesn't mean that they will necessarily be uh, uh, activated, <clears throat> but there are those forces and to identify them already, uh, you know, helps you uh, solve the problem. Uh, 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 and uh, so instead of being pessimistic, we are, I would say, Gramscian optimist. I mean, it's not an optimist that everything will uh, fall into our plate automatically. Is that there are forces that you can mobilize to uh, make, 
to avert the pessimistic prediction. But of course, you have to fight. It's the optimism of the will of the fighter. <clears throat> okay, so what we do in this book is to use the lens of creative destruction to do three main things. To revisit some main enigma in economic history, to question some common wisdoms, and to rethink the future of capitalism. So let me first talk about some historical enigma. One enigma is the industrial takeoff. Uh, work in particular by Madison uh, shows the evolution of the average per capita GDP worldwide. And you see that not much happens until 1820. That's where really growth takes off. And it happens in Europe. And so, of course, the enigma is why in Europe and why so recently? I mean, it means that growth, as we know it now, is 200 years old, three times my age. Although I'm kind of old, but it's a recent phenomenon. You know, sapiens is 10,000 years old and Neanderthal much, much older. And growth is only 200 years old and it started in Europe. Why not in China? Uh, you know, in China, there were great inventors. They invented the wheel, they invented the compass, many, many inventions in China or elsewhere. And, but you didn't have the takeoff there. You had the takeoff in Europe very recently. Why? So then we, we, we discuss that in chapter two of the book. And in fact, Joel Mokir is the one that gives the most compelling explanation. And what's very interesting is that the various elements that Mokir provides fit perfectly the Schumpeterian paradigm that I laid out. First, you need cumulative innovation. Well, Mokir tells you that, you know, uh, 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 universities that developed in Europe and you had some openness and uh, exchange of ideas in universities that helped a lot. Uh, uh, also the encyclopedia that would codify knowledge and that makes it much easier to build upon previous innovation. You had the Encyclopedia Britannica and the French Encyclopedia of Diderot. That was very important. So you had institutions in Europe that would favor the cumulative innovation process. Second, you had institutions that favor, you know, innovation runs. I mean, the problem before that is that if you make profits, you might be expropriated by the aristocracy. But, you know, in England, you had the glorious revolution. And in France, you had the French Revolution and then Napoleon. They, that led to setting up institutions that would protect property rights uh, uh, on, on things like innovation. You see, so that's, that's very important. And the third thing is creative destruction. And there, you know, uh, the problem was not only that, you know, incumbent uh, uh, firms would prevent new innovation. Also, the political power may want to prevent new innovation because they may think they may feel threatened. And in China, for example, typically uh, emperors would be uh, uh, always feel threatened by innovators and entrepreneurs. So they would try to silence them or to, you know, neutralize them. And uh, in, in Europe, the, the competition between European countries would help uh, overcome this problem. Because if, uh, if someone would, uh, you know, if a scientist would be persecuted in France, for example, he could always uh, move to England or Switzerland or, or Prussia and continue his activities or her activities in those countries that would compete with France. And, and, uh, and so that might have helped a lot the creative structure. So it's very interesting that in Europe, you had the conditions for those three uh, uh, key features to take place. So that's for the industrial takeoff. The second uh, enigma is secular stagnation. Uh, 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 we know that TFP growth you know, if we look at the evolution of TFP growth, it went up a lot between 95, 2005 in the US and then declined a lot since 2005. And we discussed that in chapter six of the book. And the most compelling explanation is that you, uh, uh, in fact, with the IT revolution, and you can see the IT revolution plays a big role because this uh, uh, rise and fall of growth is mostly observed in IT producing sectors, the black curve, and in IT using sectors, which is the gray curve. And in fact, what happens is also very interesting is that the entry rate of new firms declined since the 2000s. So the story there is that with the IT revolution, it allowed the, uh, the emergence of superstar firms and uh, uh, Amazon, uh, Walmart, uh, Microsoft, uh, and those firms, you know, they expanded. They had, you know, very good social capital, very efficient. So when they expanded, because thanks to IT, uh, that first uh, boosted growth. That's why you have this boost of growth. But then 
they, they, they invaded most sectors of the economy through mergers and acquisition. They, they became tentacular, you see. And, uh, uh, and then once they invaded most sectors of the economy, uh, uh, they became, uh, you know, a deterrent to uh, uh, innovation by non-superstar firms. And that's why you see this fall in new entry rates. So that, the, and that's very interesting because it, it, what happened in the US is that the competition policy did not adapt to the rise of these superstar firms. They, they, nothing was done to prevent them from expanding uh, as much as they wanted through mergers and acquisition. And, uh, uh, and so we discussed that. And, uh, and there is the idea that in fact, you could, if you reform competition policy in the US, you could weaken these large firms and, and, and make uh, and, uh, a low entry of new firms to take place again, you see what I mean? And, and resume, to resume. So that's very interesting because when I go back to the Schumpeter's pessimism or Gordon pessimism, they would say, well, there is nothing you can do. You are, you are, you are bound to decline. And here we say, no, there is no fatality there. Uh, uh, you, if you adapt competition policy to the digital era uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and make sure that when you allow or not uh, uh, merger and acquisition, you take into account the effect that this merger and acquisition would have on subsequent entry and subsequent innovation, uh, um, then you might be able to reverse this downward trend in growth. You see what I mean? And, uh, and that's where there is a fighting optimism. There are possibilities to uh, uh, reverse this downward trend. And, uh, uh, and that's where we are, uh, you know, Gramscian optimists, okay? Uh, the middle income trap is another one we, we discuss in chapter seven of the book. And uh, the middle income trap is the fact that some countries, you know, started to grow very fast and then they stopped growing and they stopped in the middle. Argentina was a pretty dynamic country until 1930 and then became less dynamic. But you also have Korea, Korea grew very fast between 1945 and the late 80s, and then stop, grow much slower. But you also have countries like Japan, which is not middle income, it's an advanced country, grew very fast between 1945 and the late 80s, uh, and then stop growing. And so uh, what we argue is that, you know, to grow, you have two ways of growing. One is to imitate uh, more advanced technologies, we call that catching up growth, or to innovate at the frontier. If you're already advanced, you uh, innovate at the frontier. And, uh, and the policies and institutions that are good for catching up are not exactly the same that, uh, institutions that are good for innovating at the frontier. In particular, in chapter four and seven of the book, we show that competition is very important uh, uh, to induce innovation at the frontier. Because at the frontier, I innovate to uh, uh, escape competition with my rival. You see, if I am in the business of catching up, competition is not so important. So we see that the more advanced the economy is, the more the economy has to rely on frontier innovation rather than catching up, the more competition policy in particular is important. But the problem is the following. In Korea, for example, during the catching up period, you had the emergence of big conglomerates, the Chobols. And these conglomerates, uh, not only they deterred entry of new firms, but they also managed to put pressure on governments to lobby and put pressure on government to, to not move towards more competitive institutions. You see what I mean? So they, 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 they prevented the Korean government to, uh, uh, to, to operate a transition from uh, uh, institutions that are good for catch-up growth to institutions that are good for frontier innovation, and, and uh, in particular, competition policy. But you see what that's really interesting, and the same happened in Japan. In Japan, you have the conglomerates, also called the Keritsus in Japan. Uh, they, they also, not only they, they stole the entry of other firms, but they also put pressure on the Japanese government to not move towards more competitive institutions. And, and what's very interesting is that we explain in chapter seven of the book that the crisis, the financial crisis of the late 90s, weakened the power of the, of the conglomerates in Korea. And, uh, and that allowed not only entry to, uh, uh, to resume of, no, of, non, uh, of non conglomerate firms, but also it forced the Korean government to uh, open, open up to trade and competition more than it used to. And that, in fact, boosted growth in Korea. So that's very interesting how a crisis could, in fact, have a good effect by weakening the power of the conglomerates and make it possible not only to have more entry of new firms, but also 
to have a government which promotes more pro-competition policy. So that's the middle income trap. Then we move to the source and dynamics of inequality in chapter five of the book. And uh, uh, in fact, there's been important work by Piketty, Saez, Atkinson, uh, uh, looking at the share of income of the top 1% income earners. So we call that top income inequality. And they showed that the share in developed countries, the share of income of the top 1% went up a lot since 1980. So uh, uh, that's, a very, that's a fact. The question is to explain this fact. And what we argue in chapter six of the uh, five of the book is that there are two ways to become rich. One is to innovate. You have the rents from innovation. Why? Because when you innovate, you get innovation rents. Mr. Skype became rich because he invented Skype. Mr. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Steve Jobs became rich because he invented Apple. Mr. Bill Gates became rich because he invented Microsoft. Okay? But there is another way to become rich. It's to lobby and to impose entry barriers. Mr. Carlos Slim in Mexico has become rich mainly because he's at the head of a non-regulated or, or poorly regulated, I would say, a monopoly in telecoms. And that he did very much through politics and through lobbying, okay, and, and uh, through uh, playing with the political power. So it's a very different way to become rich than innovation. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and those two sources are very different because first, you see, innovation uh, 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 generates growth. We know that. Places that innovate more grow more. Uh, uh, the lobbying does not generate growth. Okay, so that's the first difference between these two sources. But there, an, there is another difference. Here we look at the effect of innovation intensity on two measures of inequality. One is the top 1% income, that's the continuous line, and one is the Gini coefficient, which is a global measure of inequality. Okay, it's uh, how globally you depart from perfect equality, the Gini. And uh, uh, what we argue, what we show, in fact, and that's based on the work I've done with Axigit, Bergeau, Blandel, and Emus, which we report in chapter five, is that uh, more innovating places have more, a higher share of income of the top 1%. You see that the continuous curve is upward sloping, and in fact, it's a causal relationship. It's not just a correlation. Whereas uh, uh, you don't see an effect of innovation intensity on the Gini. And why not? It's because innovation has two opposite effects on inequality. On the one hand, it's true that it increases top income inequality. But on the other hand, innovation increases social mobility. And we also show in that, pay, in that work with Axigit, Bergeau, Blondel, and Emus that places in the US that innovate more have more social mobility. And why is that? Social mobility is the extent to which the uh, children's income is uncorrelated with parental income. Okay. So, uh, uh, and the reason is creative destruction. It's uh, because the creative destruction means that you have new people replacing old people. You have new, uh, you have new, new wealth replacing old wealth. That's a social mobility for you. And uh, it's particularly entrant innovation is good for social mobility. That's what we show in that, in that work with Axigit, Bergeau, Blandel, and Emus. So you see, it's very interesting. Why is it that uh, innovation does not affect global inequality? because it has two opposite effects on inequality. On the one hand, it, it, it boosts top income inequality, but it also increases social mobility. And that's why, overall, it does not affect global inequality. Another reason why also innovation is good for social mobility is that innovative firms, here I look at the, at the salary, at the wage of unqualified workers, okay? And the continuous curve is the evolution of the salary of an un unqualified worker in an innovating firm. The dotted curve is the evolution of the salary of a, a, a non-skilled non worker in a, in a non-innovating firm. And you see that innovating firms tend to pay more uh, unskilled workers, and they also give them better prospects for wage progression over time. And uh, 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 because in fact, in innov innovating firms, have more jobs that involve what I call small uh, soft skills. Even though you're not educated or no, don't have high education, it's important that you learn to become trustworthy, to interact with other workers in the firm. Uh, 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 and that's something you acquire by training and by spending time in the firm. And innovating firms do that much more than non-innovating firms. So you see really very interesting, the fact that innovation boosts social mobility. And because of that, you see overall, it, uh, 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 it uh, you see, it doesn't have an effect on global inequality. 
So you see now, uh, lobbying is very different because lobbying uh, uh, reduces entrant innovation because lobbying, it's all about preventing entry. So preventing entry of new innovators. So if you are a successful lobbyist, you will prevent new innovation. That's bad for growth. So lobbying is bad for growth. Innovation is good for growth. Lobbying is bad for growth. Lobbying also increases stop income inequality, like innovation. But lobbying, because it prevents entrant innovation, it will have a negative effect on social mobility. So lobbying has everything wrong. It reduces growth. Uh, it increases stop income inequality. But it also reduces social mobility. And therefore, lobbying increases the Gini. If I had lobbying instead of intensity of innovation, the equivalent of the dotted curve for lobbying would also be upward sloping. You see, so it's very important that, you know, to acknowledge that you have different sources of top income and they are very different. You have innovation as one source and you have lobbying as another. In the world of Piketty, for example, you only have lobbying or, or in hairs. You don't have innovators there. And it's very important to acknowledge the, the fact that you have both. But by the way, whether... Uh, you have uh, innovate, uh, in, people become rich by innovation or become rich because of lobbying. Uh, 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 you have to make sure they don't use their wealth to prevent subsequent innovation. So that you do through tax policy, but you also do that through competition policy, more importantly. So I think it's, uh, it's important to say, well, rich, I am not against the rich, particularly if they, if they become rich because they innovate. But, what, no, but no matter how they become rich, I want to make sure they don't use their wealth to prevent subsequent innovation. And that I do by fighting lobbying precisely and by competition policy mainly. So that, that's the first part of the book. But the, way, the first thing we do in the book. Now I, I get into the common wisdom. Questioning common wisdom. The first common wisdom is that taxing robots protects employment. Uh, in chapter three of the book, uh, uh, we report work with uh, my, the co-author of the book, uh, Céline Antonin simon Bunel and Xavier Jaravel. And we show that firms in France that automate, they create employment. Why do they create employment? Because in fact, they, uh, uh, they become more productive. Because they become more productive, their export price uh, goes down. And, be and because their export price goes down, they are able to sell more. That's the sale. The sale go up. They, are, they become more productive. And therefore, worldwide, they have sales that go up. And therefore, they, there is more demand for their products, and therefore, they hire more workers. So you see, may, there may be that you, when you automate, you replace machines by, uh, 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 you replace manpower by machines. But this substitution effect seems to be more than counteracted uh, uh, by a, a productivity effect, whereby when you, you automate, you become more productive. Therefore, your sales, your world market share increase, and therefore your sales go up, and therefore you employ more. So taxing robots would be a bad idea because you would prevent firms from becoming more productive and therefore from increasing their sales and therefore from hiring more. You would shoot yourself in the feet. So that's chapter three, we discussed that. So now uh, I move to the next common wisdom that we contest. It's about protectionism. In chapter 13 of the book, we show that in fact, when uh, protect, the problem with protectionist policy is that you, uh, there will be retaliation. If you wage a trade war against some other countries, the, uh, the other countries will retaliate. And therefore, what will happen is that they will close export markets to your products. But if you lose export markets, uh, that reduces the rent to potential innovation you, might, you, you would make. So if you know that you will have uh, less access to export markets, you will innovate less because you will, you will say, well, you know, I cannot sell my products anymore. And therefore, protectionist policy has the long-term consequence of discouraging innovation by domestic firms. And therefore, you lose control of value chains, in fact. You see, so, so protectionism is not the way of regaining control of value chain. Uh, very interesting that, you know, for example, we look at exports and imports in what we call anti-COVID products before the vaccine, the masks, the tests, and the respirators. Germany is in black, France is gray. The triangles are exports, the circles are imports. You see that in 2002, Germany is a little bit better than France, but not much better. But now Germany is way above France, both the exports and imports. But Germany has a surplus now, a huge surplus of 20 billion euros in those products whereas France has no surplus. 
And Germany achieved that not because they waged trade wars. They didn't do any tariff war or anything like that. They just invested and innovated. And in fact, innovation is at the heart of it. Here we look at the, at the distance from the technological frontier of France. Alors we measure the technological frontier by the production of triadic patents in uh, techno medical technologies and pharmaceuticals. Triadic patents are, are good, the good patents, those that are registered in the US patent office, Japanese patent office, and, and European patent office. Here, in 95, France is very close to the frontier. The frontier is the dotted line here. France is very close to the frontier in 95. And you see now France moved away because France stopped innovated much less over time. So that's very interesting that, in fact, you see that innovation is really the key to market share worldwide. France lost uh, in terms of market share in most sectors except nuclear and aeronautics and aircraft because uh, uh, France lost uh, in terms of innovation. And uh, uh, the best way to win the war uh, you know, in terms of, the, you know, of uh, foreign trade is not by uh, setting tariffs, it's much more by innovating. And that's what we explain in chapter 13. The, the, another common wisdom that we, uh, you know, we question is that negative growth is the way to stop climate change. So it's true that historically, if you look at the IPPC report of 2021, you see that temperature went up uh, exactly, if you look worldwide temperature started to go up exactly when you have the takeoff. You see this curve is very similar to the Madison curve that I showed earlier on growth. On, on per capita GDP taking off 1820. Uh, temperature starts increasing when growth goes up. And that's what it would have happened without the uh, Industrial Revolution. And that's what happened with the Industrial Revolution. So in the sense, uh, those who are for negative growth, they're not totally wrong in the sense that historically, indeed, uh, it's, the, it's the takeoff of growth that has induced the takeoff of temperature. And it's true also for China and India you see that CO2 emissions of China and India start taking off exactly at the time where those two countries, uh, 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 you know, where growth uh, is boosted in those two countries. So there is clearly a link between growth and CO2 emissions. So, of course, a very naive uh, uh, conclusion from this would be to say, let's go back to pre-1820. But look, I mean, we live much better than we used to. We have a life expectancy went up a lot. We, uh, you know, the, the poorest French citizen lives better than Louis XIV because, you know, medicine has gone, uh, you know, uh, dentistry, everything. You know, you, you have a much better life. Uh, you have the antibiotics, you have the penicillin, you have the vaccines, you have, uh, you know, uh, you have a much more comfortable life than, than, uh, than these guys used to have. And, and uh, that's thanks to growth uh, and prosperity. So you wouldn't want to go back to 1820. And besides, we had a natural experiment of uh, uh, negative growth. It was the first lockdown. Uh, in France, for example, but you had the same in Spain. Uh, we, we didn't have the vaccine in uh, two years ago, and we had no choice but going through a, a very strict lockdown. But I guess it was the same in Spain as in France. We had a lot, uh, between March and, and May uh, 2020, the G French GDP went down by 35%. And uh, uh, CO2 emissions went down by 8%. And uh, 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 so if we wanted to maintain, to, to solve the climate problem only by negative growth, we would need to be permanently in the first lockdown. But we, I don't know about Spain, but in France, it had very bad side effects, the first lockdown. We were forced to do it. We had no choice. But uh, the, it generated psychological problems, particularly among, among the young in the young generation. Uh, uh, many of them were, you know, lost, uh, uh, you know, lost sight, uh, you know, were really into depression and things. And so you don't want to be there permanently. And the other alternative, and we discussed that in chapter nine of the book, uh, uh, is to have green innovation, to have, uh, but the problem with green innovation, green innovation, to find new sources of energy, which are cleaner, to find new ways, to ways to save on, on uh, to pollute less, to, to uh, change our habits, to change our ways of organizing things. Uh, innovation is the key word. So the problem is, and that we, we, we show that, is that firms that used to innovate in dirty technologies in the past tend to continue to innovate in dirty technologies in the future. We call that past dependence. 
Alors, of course, the first consequence of the path dependence is that creative destruction should help you because new firms uh, uh, don't have the problem of path dependence. They didn't exist yesterday. They didn't take bad habits because they were not there. So already creative destruction in itself, it's a way to induce green innovation, okay? But uh, 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 in addition, the state has a role to play to redirect technical change towards greener innovation. You can do that through carbon price, carbon tax, but you have to be careful because if you don't do it well, you get the yellow vest movements that we had in France three years ago, okay, four years ago. Uh, 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 so that's, uh, that you have to be very careful with this. And uh, uh, you have uh, also subsidies to green innovation is another way. Industrial policy, in France, we build nuclear plants. Uh, if France contributes only 0.8% of global CO2 emission, it's a lot because we have the nuclear plant. Uh, 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 so you see, you have ways to induce, uh, that the state can induce green innovation. But we also explain in the chapter that civil society has a role to play. Consumers with the name and shame, you see, if you inform consumers about the CO2 content of inputs and outputs of various firms, you uh, uh, consumers that are motivated by the environment, that have social preferences, they will tend to purchase from those firms that are uh, more virtuous. And that's a very big driver of green innovation, actually, increasingly important. Uh, 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 and in fact, we explain that in particular in countries where there is uh, consumer awareness about uh, the environment, competition is a big driver of uh, green innovation because you innovate green to escape competition with rivals, you see? For example, if Beatrice, or if Roger and Beatrice, you know, are virtuous firms, but if first, I, if I am a monopoly and they are not there and I am not virtuous uh, uh, and I produce dirty and innovate dirty, Consumers have no choice but purchasing from me. But if now I have the competition of Roger and Beatrice, who are virtuous firms that innovate clean, I also have to innovate clean. Otherwise, I lose my customers to Roger and Beatrice. So you see the combination between uh, 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 social preferences of consumers for green and competition, it's a very powerful uh, instrument to induce green innovation, as powerful as a large increase in carbon tax, actually. Uh, three, uh, we, we, we calculated that a reasonable increase in competition amounts to the equivalent of uh, three times the price increase, uh, the tax, uh, three times the increase in carbon tax that, that triggered the yellow vest movement three years ago, in fact. So that's, uh, so you see what's very interesting with this is that you can see already the triangle, and I will talk again about the triangle between firms that innovate, the state and civil society in particular consumers. This triangle is very powerful in uh, inducing, uh, in getting, making things happen in the way you want. I will come back to that. So in that case, uh, the triangle, it's a way to induce green innovation. But more generally, the triangle induces growth altogether. And I will get back to the triangle in a moment. Okay, now I get to the third uh, uh, thing that the book does. It's to help us rethink capitalism. Uh, COVID has been a revelator. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, defects of capitalism uh, across countries worldwide. Uh, uh, in the US, it has shown a broken social model. In Europe, it has shown the weaknesses of the European innovation ecosystem. So let me, uh, let me elaborate on this a little bit. So for example, we explain the conclusion of the book. So what I talk about now, very much based on several chapters I will tell you where, that's part of the conclusion of the book. We look at, uh, you know, the fraction of individuals that lose, that, that do not have health insurance. Uh, the black curves are Germany, the gray curves are the US. The circles are the fraction of individuals without health insurance, and the triangles are the share of unemployed people. Uh, unemployment went up a lot with, at, uh, during COVID uh, in the US, and the problem is that when you lose employment in the US, you have a probability to lose access to health insurance. And you see the, the fraction of people without health insurance went down with, with uh, thanks to uh, Obamacare, but it went up uh, during COVID at the time where people needed more than ever health insurance. In Germany, everybody gets health insurance. And I guess Spain is like Germany. I have for the Spain, I don't have Spain here, but Spain is exactly like Germany. Everybody has health insurance throughout. So you see that there, 
you know, the social system in the US was not, did not do a good job at protecting the most vulnerable uh, fractions of the population against uh, COVID. Uh, uh, you can look also at the, at the, at the fraction of population uh, at, the verge, uh, at the risk of poverty. Uh, when you lose your job, uh, you are likely to fall into poverty in the US. And uh, that's why that's what you have this curve here. Poverty rate went up in the US with COVID. No such thing in Germany. Poverty rate remains constant. And I guess Spain is the same as Germany, more or less. So you see, that's where the, but that's the downside of the US capitalism. It does not good, good protection. You see, I mean, that's uh, uh, another downside I will show you is this. That's the, uh, we talk about that in chapter 11 of the book uh, 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 on uh, uh, creative destruction, health, uh, 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 and happiness. The continuous curve shows the share, uh, shows the number of dead, the mortality rate of the unskilled middle-aged white non-Hispanics in, uh, uh, in, in the US. And uh, it's this curve. And you see that it went up a lot since the 2000. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, this work is, uh, is uh, due to, is produced by Anne Case and Angus Deaton. And what they argue, they call those guys, death, those deaths, death of despair by people who lose their job. I already showed you when you lose your job, you fall into poverty and you lose health insurance, but you also have, you know, you lose status and uh, family very often dislocates when you become unemployed. Uh, uh, so uh, that generates lots of stress. And people, when they are stressed, they take on uh, opioids, antidepressants, uh, sleeping pills. Uh, they, they start eating like crazy pizzas and things. They become obese. And that's, that, that, all that, of course, contributes to this rising mortality rate that you have there. You don't have such thing in uh, most European countries. You have a little bit in the, in, uh, in the UK, but less still than, the, than in the US, okay? So that's, uh, uh, that's what you have in the US. So that's the downside of the US model. But the upside of the US model is the innovation ecosystem. And we describe the innovation ecosystem in detail in chapter 12 of the book on financing creative destruction. Uh, 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 you can see here, that's, uh, the, so that's both from the conclusion and chapter 12. Here you see the number of biotech patents in the US per million inhabitants uh, in 2016. It's much higher than e EU average or OECD average. So, and if, and if they're restricted attention to the triadic patents or to the most cited patents, the gap between US and the rest of the world will be even much bigger. So they are much better at producing patents. And why are they so good? Is because they have a fantastic ecosystem. We argue already in chapter 10 of the book uh, uh, on, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, it's called innovation behind the scenes. We argue that in fact, you see innovation is a whole process. It goes from basic research to applied uh, research and, 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 and commercialization. So you have all these stages in the innovation process. And each stage, of course, the basic research is based on in research labs and universities. And, uh, but universities in the US are very well funded and organized and governed. You have very good governance and, and funding of universities in the US. Uh, 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 but in addition, basic research, you have very good agencies that help you finance basic research. And for example, uh, you have the National Science Foundation. So of course, modeled on the, you know, on, based on the financial, in, in uh, in Europe, we created the European Research Council more recently. That what was on the exactly, you know, uh, uh, based trying to emulate the example of the National Science Foundation. Uh, uh, that that worked very really well. Uh, then we uh, uh, they also have in biotech they have the National Institute of Health, which also finances basic research, and they have also private donors institutions, like for example the Howard Hughes medical investigator, uh, which we describe also in chapter 12 of the book. And those finance, they try to identify very promising researchers and they finance them, they finance them long term, like 10 years. And they, they allow these people to take lots of risk and to be, therefore be engage in very innovative research. And uh, uh, there is substantial effect. They produce lots of Nobel Prize and things, these uh, OR Duke medical investigator. There's a very big effect, and we talk about all that in chapter 12. So all, 
they have all this for just basic research. We don't have that much in Europe uh, 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 as they do in the US. But then you, so you go from basic research to uh, private sector research, to development. And uh, uh, then you, do, you have to start, you know, create startups. Uh, well, for startups, you know, venture capital and business angels are very, you know, it, it's suited, it's a, it's, and private equity are, you know, are very helpful for startups. You know, they are the, the good in financial instruments for startups. And of course, in the US, venture capital is much more developed than it is in Europe. Uh, uh, uh. Then when you grow, uh, the firm grows, it goes public. And when the firm goes public, it still needs financing. And there, institutional investors play a big role. Uh, mutual funds, pension funds, those are also much more developed in the US than in Europe. And finally, there is this institution called DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Uh, uh, that was created uh, uh, in the 1950s. I used to say it was creating during the Cold War. We are back into Cold War now. But the first Cold War, the, 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 uh, the, the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union, uh, they were racing on defense and, and space already. And, uh, uh, and you have to fulfill a mission. For example, the Russians, they put Gagarin in space. You, well, you know, we don't want to look stupid. We have to manage to, within a year or two, to put a man in space. So we have a clear mission. The basic research is there, but you need to achieve the objective and you need to coordinate resources and actors very quickly. So the Americans created the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA. The way it works is that the money, the funding comes from the ministry. Then the, they, they name uh, team leaders for a period of three to five years. And the team leaders are uh, free to elicit competing projects. So you have a top-down part, the money comes from the ministry, but the bottom-up is that the team leaders, they elicit many competing projects uh, from bottom-up. And, and, uh, uh, and that's how the DARPA generated the GPS, the autonomous navigation, internet, laser, all those things are indirectly, uh, 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 you know, consequences of DARPA. Uh, it was a big success. Then they created the ARPA Energy in the US, and then they created the BARDA, the biomedical, uh, 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 the, bi uh, the, the, bi the biomedical uh, um, advanced research and development authority, and uh, and the BARDA is exactly the similar is the equivalent of DARPA for uh, you know for uh, biotech products, and in particular for uh, it's the BARDA that you know finance the vaccines. I mean all the you had the RNA messenger technology that was the basic research generating it. And then you had to turn it within a year into mass production of vaccine based on RNA. And uh, well, that's how you had Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson, uh, well, other, you know, were all labs financed by Barda. And Barda spent $12 billion uh, last year uh, uh, to, on COVID vaccines mainly. And whereas at the same time, European Commission and EIB spend only 4 billion and we don't have the equivalent of the BARDA. So you see, you have the fantastic ecosystem of innovation in the US. So now rethinking capitalism, what I would like is to combine the good side of the American model, innovation, with the good side of the European model, protection. Some people believe that if you go for one, you don't go, you have to sacrifice the other. That if you choose to be innovating, you have to renounce being protective and inclusive. If you choose to be protective and inclusive, you have to renounce being innovative. But in fact, I want to mention three types of policies that makes you both more innovating and more protective and inclusive. So the first one is flex security. As I told you before, in the US, when you lose your job, you are miserable. You, you go, you know, you lose status, you, lose, uh, you go into poverty, you might lose health insurance. Uh, as a result, mortality, you have the death of despair and all that. But uh, in chapter 11 also, we, we describe, we contrast with Denmark, and that's the work of Alexandra Roulet. In Denmark, uh, uh, Alexandra compares the health of a worker in a firm that closes down with, uh, uh, with the health of an identical worker in terms of age, education, experience in a firm that does not close down. So she does what we call a diff and diff. And she says that, you know, if she first look at the effect, uh, how the difference between the, the worker in the firm that closed down and the worker that does not close down is affected by, uh, 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 you know, in terms of purchasing antidepressants. And you see, 
At time zero, that's the time where the, the firm closed down for the first worker, not for the other one, which is the control group. And you see there is no difference between them before, and there is no difference between them after. So uh, 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 you have no effect of becoming unemployed in Denmark on the purchase of antidepressants, anti-anxiety, or sleeping pills. You have no effect in Denmark of becoming unemployed on the probability of having a circulatory problem. And you have no effect on mortality either. Why? Because in Denmark, they invented the flex security system. How does it work, the flex security? When you lose your job for three years, you get 90% of your salary. The, the state helps you retrain and find a new job for you. If you refuse more than two jobs in your qualification, then you lose unemployment insurance. But in fact, this system works very well. It makes creative destruction more efficient because the state helps people rebounce from one job to another and retrain for, to move from one job to another. So that makes creative destruction works much better. And it allows firms to be much more flexible in the hiring and layoff policy because you have this flex security system behind. But on the other hand, people are well protected. You see, so that's something that makes you both more innovative and more productive. Education is another one. In chapter 10 of the book, we look at the, you know, education and innovation. In fact. Uh, it's very interesting that if you look in the US, but in Finland as well, at the relationship between parental income and the probability of inventing, you get always this J curve. If I have parents in, in low income brackets, very low probability of inventing. And, it's, and when I have parents in the high income brackets, I'm much more likely to innovate. So the horizontal line, the horizontal axis is the parental income, and the vertical axis is the probability of inventing. So that's US uh, uh, current data. This is US historical data, and that's Finland. You have the same in Finland. It's very surprising because Finland has an education system which is free and high quality. They have very good PISA tests in Finland. So what, how come, what, what's the enigma in Finland? In Finland, what you can show is that, in fact, uh, when you control for parental education, this uh, J-curve goes, it flattens out a lot. So in fact, the story in Finland is that, why is it that parental income matter? It's because the, the parents that earn more, they are more educated and therefore, that's why, and when, and when you have more educated parents, they transmit uh, knowledge, but also aspirations to their children. And that's why you have more innovators when they are born to parents uh, in families where parents are more educated. So the, the, in Finland, uh, 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 the relationship between parental income and uh, uh, probability of inventing, in fact, is a re reflects just the fact that high, high income uh, is, is uh, corresponds to more educated parents. So that's, that's a very interesting. It's less true in the US because in the US you have to pay for tuitions, sc uh, good schools are expensive or living in areas where you have good schools, it's expensive. So money matters much more in the US per se. In, in, in Finland, it's not money per se. It's just the fact that parents that earn more are also more educated parents. Now, uh, you could think, but well, why should, uh, uh, in Finland, why should parental education matter at all? If schools are very good, you learn everything you need at school. You don't need your parents. But in fact, the, pro the, question, the enigma is that in Finland, the solution to the enigma of the Finnish enigma is that in Finland, the ref uh, they reformed their education system only in 1970. So that's where they made it much more inclusive. Uh, 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 if you restrict attention to uh, inventors that went through the Finnish education system after 70, the J curve flattens completely. So it's really because most of the inventors are, went to school before 1970 that you have this J curve also in Finland. But that shows that education is very important. And uh, uh, in fact, in our countries, we have what, a lot of what we call lost Einstein. Uh, many people who could become innovators, but they are born to families that can, but they didn't get the, the appropriate education. And they are born to families who could not transmit the knowledge to them. So, uh, but now if you had, uh, uh, my prediction is that in Finland, after some gener several generations, uh, 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 the J-curve will flatten out because uh, uh, most researchers will have gone through the education system that Finland has since 1970. And there, it means that if you have such inclusive education, high quality for everybody, 
you have more, you make the economy more innovative because you have more potential innovators, but you also make <coughs> the <coughs> you also make growth more inclusive because precisely more people innovate. So education is something that makes you both more innovative and more inclusive. Okay. The last one is competition. I told you before <coughs> about the decline in productivity growth in the US, and, and I told you that it's very much associated to the superstar firms. You see that, in fact, they expanded so much that they discouraged entry uh, uh, by non-superstar firms, and that's exactly what you observe, the decline in entry rate in the US since 2000. So now, if you adapt competition policy to the digital era, if, for example, you, you break up large conglomerates or you, uh, you, <coughs> you, show, you force them to share data or you, uh, uh, you adapt, you know, for when deciding about merger and acquisition, you make sure that, you know, it has no detrimental effect on entry and innovation of, of other firms. There, you will certainly boost uh, uh, growth and innovation because you will boost entrant innovation. You will reverse this downward trend in entry. So you will boost entrant innovation. That will make the economy more innovative, but also it will make it more inclusive because I showed you before that entrant innovation is a source of social mobility. So by doing this, not only you make the economy more innovative, but also more inclusive because you foster entrant innovation. And so that's again an instrument for, that will make you both more innovative and more inclusive. You see, so that's, that goes for the fact that there is hope to make, to have a capitalism which is both innovative and also protective and inclusive. Now, I want to conclude here, and I want to start saying, well, you know, uh, Schumpeter was pessimistic because he thought that the first innovators would turn into entrenched conglomerates that would successfully block subsequent innovation. But uh, uh, that's the firms, the marché, the market, mercado, that's the firms, okay? But uh, uh, we, we already argued that the state could do something about it. The state, uh, Estado, uh, could do something about it because the state could have competition policy in particular. Uh, uh, the problem is that, and we saw that when we discussed, uh, 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 when we discussed a middle income trap in particular, is that the firms, the, the existing congl uh, conglomerates, the incumbent firms, can try to, to capture the state. They can try to prevent the state from implementing more competitive policy. We saw that in the case of Korea and Japan in particular. Okay. Then when you could say, well, but maybe Montesquieu can help you. You can have separation of power. Maybe the executive can be captured by the market, by the incumbent firms, but the judiciary could be there to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to indict the, those uh, government officials that are being corrupted by, by the firms, by the, by the incumbent firms. So you could think that to some extent you could rely on Montesquieu and the separation of power. The problem is that the, the constitution, and we have viewed that in chapter 15 of the book, the constitutions are incomplete contracts. And because they are incomplete contracts, you can have, you know, uh, 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 for example, uh, Colombia has the same constitution as France, essentially. But in Colombia, when you are a union leader, you are likely to be killed. Uh, in France, you are not because you have civil society. You see, that's the thing. Uh, uh, France has a history of labor movement and civil society. And, uh, uh, and that's why when you are a union leader in France, you are much less likely to be killed than in Colombia, although the constitutions are, look identical. Okay. And that's why the triangle is very important. You need firms that innovate. You need the state that regulate. But to make sure that the state will not be captured by the firm, you need civil society. And that's where the triangle is very important. That's an idea that Sam Bowles and Wendy Carlin have very much developed. And uh, it's very relevant for Schumpeter and growth. If you want to avert the pessimism of Schumpeter, this triangle is very crucial because you need the state to make sure that you know, uh, 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 incumbent firms will not prevent new entry. But you know, the state can be captured. And to make sure that this has not happened, civil society is very important. OK. And, uh, 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 so, but we also saw the role of the triangle when we talk about green innovation. Huh? Firms are those who innovate green or not green. The state can uh, act with the carbon tax, uh, industrial policy, subsidies to green innovation. But we also saw the role of civil society, consumers and things, and to also make sure that the state will do the right thing. So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say. It's just to tell you the role of civil society 
I mean, in the US, they had the civil war. When they had the civil war, you know, uh, the result is that the North won against uh, the South and uh, slavery was abolished. Uh, and then they introduced the 15th Amendment in the US Constitution, uh, uh, allowing for uh, uh, African-Americans to vote. But the problem is that the Southern state in the US circumvented this amendment by introducing literacy tests that of course nobody could ever pass. And so in fact, the African-Americans could never vote in the Southern state. And it took the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s to finally uh, have the voting act of the Supreme Court in 1964 that, that, that banned uh, uh, the uh, literacy test and made, and made it possible for African-Americans in Southern South to indeed vote. It took 100 years and civil society to make, to turn something which was in the constitution, the 15th amendment into something real from judge being something formal. You see, so that's what I, uh, uh, that's the outline of the book. And uh, uh, we, in, part, in chapter one, we talk about the Schopenhauer paradigm. We contrast it with solo. We also show that, you know, how we measure creative destruction. Uh, and we have the outline of the whole book. The takeoff is chapter two. The, the waves and the, the robots is chapter three. Competition uh, is chapter four, explaining in particular why competition is more important to frontier innovation than non-frontier innovation. Inequality, chapter five. Secular stagnation, chapter six, middle income track, chapter seven. Here we talk about structural change, agriculture into industry, into services. Uh, chapter nine, green innovation, 10 behind the scenes. That's where we talk about, you know, basic research in universities, applied research in firms. And that's where we talk uh, about, uh, you know, parental, the, the importance of parental income and parental education uh, for innovating. Uh, in chapter 11 is where we talk about health, happiness, the social system. Chapter 12, the ecosystem of innovation. Globalization and protectionism is discussed here. Here we explain how historically investor state and insurer state emerged. And here we talk about this triangle between firm state and civil society. So I think I will stop there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.